Good, good morning, and uh, welcome to uh, Medical Grand Rounds. Just an announcement for next week, uh, Nigam Shah in our uh, Division of Biomedical Informatics Research will be presenting on what is an informatics consult. So uh, please be sure to uh, attend next week. Today it's really a, uh, a privilege and an honor to, uh, to welcome a uh, longstanding member of the Stanford community, Professor Fernando uh, Mendoza, to, uh, to join us here in Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, Fernando is a professor of pediatrics and the associate dean of minority advising and programs at the, uh, at the School of Medicine. He is a native of uh, San Jose, California. He graduated from San Jose University, and then we were fortunate to uh, recruit him to Stanford Medical School, and he has essentially never left. He is, uh, he's a graduate of the medical school. He received his pediatric training here at, uh, at Stanford. He did obtain a Master's of Public Health from a well-known university in Cambridge, but um, then he was an RWJ academic uh, general pediatric fellow here at Stanford. Following that series of training and education, he joined the uh, Stanford faculty in, uh, in 1981, and he became a dean for minority advising early in his tenure as a uh, faculty member in 1983. Um, that was not enough leadership opportunity so for Fernando, so for almost 20 years, he led the uh, division and service line for general pediatrics at Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. His academic career, which is uh, intersected on the research and education sides, is focused on Latino child health and workforce diversity. His, uh, his list of uh, research accomplishments are numerous in this area as are some of the key studies that he was the, uh, the first to uh, put forward um, uh, some seminal observations, including publishing the first study of diversity in uh, departments of pediatrics. And I suspect he's very proud that our Department of Pediatrics is now one of the most diverse departments for training in the, uh, in the school. He has had a, a number of national roles, including serving on an IOM committee for the health of uh, immigrant children and families. He's received multiple awards, and maybe most notable, He's received the President's Award for Excellence Through Diversity from, uh, from Stanford. So with that as an introduction, please help me in uh, welcoming our friend and colleague, Fernando Mendoza. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm going to talk about diversity at Stanford in a bit of a story, because uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been here almost 45 years now. Um, I have no conflicts, though the only Trump joke I'll make is I am a Mexican, so I think uh, Trump needs to know that. <laughs> so what I would like to do is describe the national importance of diversity in the workforce and its implications for patient care and practice, review the history of diversity at Stanford Medical School and its implications for the school's mission, and lastly, provide some best practice methods to improve diversity in the workforce. What is diversity? Well, that's a complicated issue, but I think if you look at this information here, what we see is that basically, uh, just from the population, the blue bars are not Hispanic whites. Here is the United States, and then we have California. Uh, and actually, the Census Bureau estimates that the United States will look like California in the next 20 years. But if you look at our area, Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County, San Mateo, Alameda, we indeed have the kind of diversity that you almost see no place else. Um, a third white, almost a quarter uh, Hispanic, and then uh, more than a third Asian American. Asian American is that big groups of multiple groups. And another way to kind of see the diversity here is in fact, there's 150 languages spoken in the Bay Area, 150. Yet. When we talk about diversity, it, we're not just in one category. That is, you can be a Latino, but you can be a Latino that speaks Spanish, a Latino that's an immigrant, a Latino that's been like Ron Garcia here. Uh, before the state, his family's been here before the state of California was formed. Uh, so you have all this mixture, uh, sexual minorities, minorities in terms of education, background, all that. So when we talk about diversity, it's useful for us to kind of think about what that means. The other part of diversity is really the issue of inclusion. So diversity is the numbers, 
But the inclusion is, do they participate? Do they become part of the society, the schools, the organizations that we look toward in terms of diversity? To me as a pediatrician, and to all of us as physicians, diversity is going to bring a sense of how do we take care of people, right? And if one looks at the World Health Organization, the CDC model, uh, this is the model that they're, they're, they're really proposing that we should think about in, in terms of keeping care and making people healthy. The model has different parts, and you see the gene biology is a very small sector. Health behavior is a larger sector. Health care, another sector. But the biggest sector is really the environment. That's what makes the people either healthy or unhealthy, and, and those things are things that have to do Quite commonly, we think about poverty, uh, perhaps low education, but as the, the populations become more diverse, other things, race and ethnicity issues, stereotypes, cultural differences, language literacy, disenfranchisement from social institutions. We think about Black Lives Matter and how people feel where they belong in the community, how community institutions work for them. And then lastly, immigration. And immigration is a hot topic, will continue to be a hot topic, and in a global environment, it's a hot topic around the world. So I think if we think about diversity, diversity impacts medicine in many different ways. That little section on, on, on the genetics. Uh, precision medicine, President Obama uh, has put forth uh, an initiative to look at a million people. Uh, grants have been given out. Uh, Mark Cullen and Bonnie Maldonado got one of those grants to look at the precision medicine uh, for diverse populations. But I was recently at a NIH uh, genomics uh, workshop, and one of the things that came out is we really don't have good information that's about diversity in the population. If you look at this, uh, this is a study done by one of our colleagues, Bustamante, and Esteban Bouchard, which I'll talk about in a minute, published in Nature. They looked at all the data with regard to genomics. 96% of that data comes from European Americans. How does that apply to us here? How does it apply to the rest of the world? Is it good science to do everything based on one subsample of our, of our humanity? So I think this speaks to the issue that diversity is not just a clinical issue, it is a science issue. Moreover. What is, what is race and ethnicity? Was our President Obama, was he black or was he white? And these are social contracts, or social constructs that we look at, but I think as we move towards a world diversity, we're gonna have to become more refined of how we talk about this. Uh, so when I think about diversity, uh, it is really lots of different things. This is a word kind of, uh, collage what people think about when they speak about diversity. And indeed, you may take one of those things and say, here's what I think. This is, this is the word that best exemplifies it for me. But the different perspectives that I've seen over the years is really impressive of how people start to think about uh, diversity. Uh, departments of Medicine, School of Medicine, we become mission driven. We say diversity is part of that. And in fact, LCME that accredits the medical school requires us to do diversity in our faculty, to our students, have plans, et cetera. It's become a standard. Uh, what about the healthcare system? Who does diversity? Well, our, our colleagues at Kaiser do diversity. Our colleagues at Kaiser cover 40% of the population in California, and they have spent a lot of time thinking about diversity. Why? Good business. They're trying to capture as many people in California as possible. They actually look at patient satisfaction based on diversity, and they either promote or don't promote somebody into partnership based on diversity. So that's the competition for Stanford, clearly, and they're thinking about it all the time. Diversity in the community, this weekend, we had marches about diversity, right? People want to be included. They want to be part of the institutions that make our society work. And inclusive is our healthcare system. They want to know that people are responsive to that issue. So I think if we look at this, diversity and inclusion are vehicles of excellence. 
Because at the end of the day, if you live in a diverse society, hard, how do you become excellent unless you have some sense of diversity? Now, this is, diversity has been a big issue for a long time, but it's also been very complicated in how we think about it. My colleague, uh, Mark Neve, who was uh, Chief Diversity Officer at the AAMC, came up with this sort of uh, DOS kind of approach. Uh, the first one, he said, diversity operating system was the idea that diversity is an end in itself, so we get numbers and that's fine. So racial ethnic diversity was important but not critical. Uh, it just, we wanted to make sure there was some other people in our, in our communities. And that in itself was important. Um, but then he thought, well, the next stage, if they're here, what are they gonna do for the rest of the institution? And indeed, he talks about enhancing the educational environment, teaching diversity, enhances intellectual development, service orientation, self-awareness, cultural competency, but it's still not integrated in all the things you do. And lastly, diversity 3.0 which is at the end of the day, everything that we do, research, education, clinical care, administration, needs to have a sense of what diversity is and how we work, right? If we have a diverse team, how do we make that successful? If we have diverse populations, how do we encourage them? If we have a focus on patient-centered care, what does that mean? In order to do that though, I think we need leadership and clearly in our institution, Leadership comes from faculty and academic leaders. So we can't do 3.0 without faculty. And that unfortunately brings us to the problem, which is um, I became a dean in 1983. Uh, these numbers are medical school graduates. Uh, you see these lower lines that go pretty flat. Those are underrepresented minorities. The line that kind of goes up a little bit, the brown lines, Asian Americans and then women, the dark green and men. So one of our problems is our system hasn't worked to make itself diverse. It still is sort of crippled to some extent of what we can do to kind of make that diverse. More work, if you look at when I started medical school many years ago, 1971 in the present, we see that in fact the faculty has changed but perhaps not as much as we think it would have changed. We have white men coming from 72% to about 40%, women from 12 to 20%, and then these lower numbers are Asian Americans and the minorities. I'm gonna just expand that. You see here Asian Americans going up. This other group is unknown. I'm not sure what that means. It may mean that people just don't wanna deal with it. But I think at the end of the day, I look at when I started, when I started as a faculty member in 1981, there was 0.5% Mexican American faculty. Today, 0.6%. I don't think that's great progress. It is, at the end of the day, something that we have to think about. California, half of all the kids in California are Latino. That's the human capital of California. If we can't utilize that, then our society is not gonna work real well. So, what's the Stanford story? Uh, I'm using sort of information from Phil Lee, who did a nice report about Stanford UCSF and my own personal experience, so you get both. School moves down here, 59. From 59 to 68, what's the situation? Well, you see the class here. That you can see in the middle, there's four women surrounded by men. Uh, that was basically most medical schools, maybe one African American. But indeed, you know, that was American medicine. In the 60s, we were concerned about civil rights, Vietnam, so there was a social disruption. But still, we didn't do anything until something happened. And that something was the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King. So that brought people and students from campus say, we have to do something. So what did we do? Well, I, I call this uh, a decade of trying to increase underrepresented minorities. And that's when our, our sort of story begins at Stanford, 1969. It was actually pretty interesting because it was generated by students on campus and by one African-American medical student. That was the only African-American student at Stanford. And that was uh, Roberto Ilan. Um, 
he was very much involved with the faculty, faculty senate, to say we need to do something and this is what we need to do. I think if I look at what he did, was really initiate the beginning of what we call holistic review. And that in itself looked at not just, you know, where did you go to school? Did you go to Harvard or Yale? Did you have a MCATs of 99% and did you have a 4.0? Those were assessments of quality, right? But he said, well, you know, if you were the first one to go to college, uh, you're poor, that experience is not gonna be yours. So what he said, let's look at the evidence for academic achievement and promise for the future, a trajectory. Are you going like this or are you going like that in terms of academics? Motivation to medicine. Are you committed to excel? And consider how far the candidate has journeyed uh, to apply to medical school, the, what we call distance travel, which is if your father uh, never graduated from college, uh, high school, you come from a poor family, how do you expect that person to really jump over where that and compete with somebody who has the exact opposite, right? And lastly, I think from the beginning, it was the issue of who is this person? Do we have evidence of leadership? Do we have evidence that this person is gonna make a difference? So this I call 1.0, diversity, increased representation. But the issue was, where are we gonna find these people? Well, <laughs> This is me, uh, you can tell, because that kid has microcephaly, a big head. I still have it. My father was a, initially a farm worker, then a truck driver, sixth grade education, went to a segregated school in California. Mother, born in the US, in El Paso, but grew up in Juarez, went to high school. So we were basically, you know, a common uh, phenomenon that we still see today. Poor, lower middle class, have not gone through an educational you know, uh, college experience, et cetera. The two things, just quickly, is what made a difference to me, because I think about how did I get here. The first was I remember one day, and I was the only Mexican kid in a white school, and the teacher uh, in sixth grade asked an arithmetic question. I raised my hand. He said, Fernando, put your hand down. You already know the answer. And on that day, I knew I could do anything, because I knew I was smart somebody anointed me as being smart. The second thing was in high school, got called into my high school counselor, and she said to me, I heard you wanted to be a doctor. That's the first time I heard I wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, why not? That sounds good. I love science and math, <laughs> right? So I ended up going to San Jose State, uh, and the value of education was key for my parents. Here's when I graduated. You can see how, how happy my family is. <laughs> I still can't remember how that happened. But. And then I ended up applying to medical school, right? And I applied to the schools in California, uh, UCSF, San, you know, San Diego, and Stanford. And sometimes happenstance occurs and you just go along with it, right? So I end up writing Stanford Thank you for uh, looking at my application. Can you send more information? And they write back, we're glad you're coming. <laughs> and I say, I guess I'll go there. <laughs> and 45 years, I'm still here. But I think at the end of the day, the, the question was, who were we? And this is my colleagues coming from a quota in under affirmative action, okay? We were less qualified, right? And indeed, you know, we didn't go to Sta Harvard and Stanford, we came from these small schools. Um, and I think one of the things that I can say is it's hard to see what the future holds. What did the future hold here? Well, I'm here. Maisie Isabel was a professor of faculty at Cook County in family medicine. Cleveland Moore got a uh, chair position in immunology allergies at Louisiana State. Chester Randall was actually a part of my ICU team here. Jose Santos taught uh, my colleague here, Abraham, and was the head of the Children's Hospital in Mexico City, the largest hospital, Children's Hospital in all of Latin America. And Al 
Alex, my compadre, is quadruple birth, headed the ICU at San Diego Children's. If you look at this, you would never assume that would happen, right? Because we're looking at faces that don't look like what we see, and therefore we can't anticipate that will happen. So what happened here to make this go? Well, first we had two great champions, Roy Mafley. I was trying to find a picture of Roy, couldn't. The only picture I had when he came to my wedding, which was great, but it wasn't clear enough. But Roy was the champion. And how did he make himself a champion? Roy taught renal physiology, and he had the impression, well, these are students who are probably going to struggle. But he recalled that he looked at a test with one class, and the highest score in that test was an African-American student. And he said to himself, how does that happen? What well, happens because your judgment initially was wrong. Students from all backgrounds can succeed if they work hard. The other ones, I think Bill Brown, my old colleague and friend, a, a biostatistician, worked with us to put not just a limit on MCATs and GPA, but really think who's going to succeed. And Gabe Garcia tells me they still use this equation, which is basically if you're above the median on these things, you can come to Stanford and succeed. It depends how much energy and other things you have. So Bill was very helpful in looking at not limiting us from the MCAT and GPA. And then everybody else helped us understand how to assess distance traveled. And then having people that weren't, uh, that were from these groups in that process gave us a sense to look at the issue of unconscious bias. Because if you're sitting there and you look at this person, this person looks like me, you can add that to the discussion. That first decade, we got people here. After that, then what are we going to do with them? <laughs> they're here. They're going to medicine. My good friend and colleague, Bob Cutler, I don't know, you know if any of you remember him, but he was indeed a great gentleman. Uh, I became a dean in 1983, as I mentioned, with Roger Peaks, one of your faculty here. And Bob brought me in one day and said, look, they're here. We need to make sure they do research and they become faculty. So what we started, along with my colleague Ron Garcia, Pat Cross, early matric program, which really we brought people here in the summer and we said, I told them, I want you to be faculty here. I want you to be part of the Stanford family. We gave them ex ex experience to do research. And what ended up is we have this kind of productivity. Uh, Dr. Ford, a young African-American urologist, Dr. DeAnda, uh, a chaired cardiac surgery uh, surgeon at uh, Texas, um, an ICU cardiac, pediatric cardiac intensivist, who now is at Hopkins, was at Boston. Some of these folks you see are here. Uh, a uh, Apache Mexican, who now is a pathologist at the Mayo Clinic. And then my, one of my students, Esteban Bouchard, who is consulting with the President of the United States on precision medicine. So could we have seen this from the time we saw them as students? I think the answer is no. And the only way this happens is when we're able to kind of look forward. Now, that was that decade that I call faculty development. And indeed, what we're looking at now is other decades. And I hate to talk this way, but I've been here decades, right? And at the end of the day, what we've gone through is looking at the decade of what I call institutional diversity. How do we become more than just little programs, but bigger? We were lucky enough to get our Center of Excellence grant from the federal government. We've had that for 25 years, putting those things in. Uh, we've tried to increase the pipeline with these different things, but at the end of the day, that's always been a struggle. Phil Pizzo came in 2001, and what he did was said, we need to institutionalize this more. He developed the Office of Diversity and Leadership. Hannah Valentine led that. And she was very active, as many of you know, to kind of move these things all forward. Um, but in addition, when we continue to see low numbers, one of the things that raised in my mind, if I can't get more, can I make them better? Can we make them leaders? And that's when we started the Leadership and Diversity, uh, Leadership and Cultural Disparities Program. 
that my colleague Juan Garcia, Mark uh, Gutierrez worked to do. And it, at the end, it really becomes important because we have said, we want you not just to be a physician, we want you to lead something. We want you to make a difference. That ended up having things in that inclusion period of not just looking at minorities, but women, all other groups, and how do we get them included? Uh, so that I call inclusion. And then this last decade, we've been looking at how to make diversity 3.0, where we think about it in totality work. And what we've done, Bonnie Mel now the now in charge of the office, is change it from the Office of Diversity and Leadership to the Office of Faculty Development and Diversity. Uh, Dean Miner has helped us develop a task force to look at diversity among the students, education, practices. And I think this has permeated. We, in fact, with Lars Osterberg, are thinking about how do we teach about diversity? How do we teach about unconscious bias? And these are all things, therefore, that the school has not only done, but if I look at this across the nation, we have been a leader. So I think we all should be proud. So where do we stand? Here's looking at the School of Medicine, Pediatrics and Medicine, uh, residents, fellows, assistant professors, associate professors, et cetera, total. There, there is certainly variability. I think the biggest variability is when you go from the medical, particularly for underrepresented minorities, from medical students to residents. There's a significant drop off, I, and I call it more of a funnel than a pipeline, but it does speak to us of where we need to think about doing our work. It is, you know, most schools in here, we're doing pretty well in the student. Uh, 16 is the average, but we get up to 25% of our class. And in fact, if you look at diversity of our medical school class, I always ask how many of you speak another language other than English? 40, 50% raise their hand. So it's a very broad, diverse group. So what do we, what do we look at here? Well, our school is, is in itself diverse with regard to diversity. These are the numbers for uh, residents. You see some have more than others. These are percents. Uh, and I think when we look at data that says, where do people actually go uh, over the last 10 years or so, 112 and of our medical students went through into internal medicine. And we have you know, some variability, but you see some of the schools up there, these the top 10, are making different kinds of efforts, some being more successful than others. I'd like to kind of uh, highlight pediatrics because I think the people there, uh, Becky Blankenberg, uh, Laura Backrack, uh, Michelle and, and Rania uh, are all our faculty that are really committed to this. And what they've done is over the years, since 2008, made an effort to look at how to make sure the climate here is, is rewarding for people from diverse backgrounds. We've had efforts that we paid for, the school paid for, to bring students here to be exposed. Every time I'm out there, people say, well, why would I want to go to Stanford? It's in Palo Alto, all those wealthy people, right? You guys don't see any, any patients that are not wealthy. Some people wish, right? <laughs> but at the end of the day, that is out there. Uh, so they have to look at that. We have to create what's the value of Stanford? Why come here? Uh, we also have to say, okay, if we're going to look at people, how do we broaden that umbrella? And that is the holistic review. 50 years ago, well, Bill Brown did that number. You, you get a certain cutoff point. Beyond that, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Becky and her group have been using that. More so, there's a limited focus now on that. And if we look at the productivity, 18% our residents are minorities. 41% have gone into subspecialty, 65% in academic, and indeed, no board problem. So this is doable. You can make change if one has the sort of uh, the program. So lastly, what made America great? I won't answer that one, but <laughs> I think <laughs> population diversity, right? people that came here, with what we call the ganas, the willingness to do something, right? The willingness to kind of put the effort in and to make a change and be successful. 
Diversity is a key factor. It's going to always be a key factor, particularly for us, in patient care, precision medicine, uh, patient-focused education, and understanding the effects of, the, of uh, social disparity. But it does take leaders, academic leaders, to be able to take a calculated risk. This is not a risk with eyes closed. It's a risk understanding how do we do this well. And I think our history shows that we can do this well. We've done it well. Uh, if I look at those pictures of who those students were and where they are now, that tells me that we've done something that very few schools have done. We've changed the face of medicine. And that, at the end of the day, is what academic, outstanding academic institutions need to do. So what are those things, the best practices? Well, I think the environment has to be enticing, that we do diversity leaning, holistic uh, uh, processes. We're assessing all these things I've talked about, trajectory, distance traveled, uh, access to others and leadership. Uh, in, in other words, are we getting the leaders that we think we are? Considered unconscious bias by having divest, diverse assessors. And then making a commitment to them that we are going to make you succeed. We're going to make you go where you want to go. And that, at the end of the day, is why people would come to Stanford. Dean Miner has taken this on very personally. He has, for each chair, put a diversity metric. Each department, now with Bonnie Maldonado, has a diversity liaison. We've changed the mission to include diversity and inclusion. And we've had conversations on the broader scheme of things with the whole community about what diversity means to us. We've established the Office of uh, Development and uh, Faculty Development Diversity. Uh, Myself and Bonnie Maldonado head the diversity cabinet, which is trying to organize everybody, look at a certain vision, go in a certain direction. So we don't go by ourselves, but we go as a group. Uh, the task force on diversity is inclusive of students and trainees, residents, fellows, thinking, how can we make this a better place for you? And they tell us. And lastly, the Center of Excellence, which my colleague Ron and I have headed, is something that I think is important. When I think about what is excellence in, in diversity in medical education, it makes us rethink what that should mean. So the first class, this class, our uh, mission statement is at the end of the day now something I think we should be very proud of. These folks, if I look at them and reflect upon the students that I saw, these are going to be the leaders that change American medicine. Thank you. In case you're interested, uh, there's a nice uh, review of the history here by Phil Reed. I can, I can take a Seven Bouchard as an example. He came from a single parent home, poor family. He had to work. He came in our Area of Trick program. I got him hooked up with Carol Clayton, who was a outstanding uh, scientist. And from day one, he got the mentorship to say, you can do this. Uh, I was just talking to another colleague about another African-American, Jerome Kennedy, who came from Howard and came here, uh, was interested in neurosurgery. And many people have known him as he's from Howard, but that was a different reason. He hooked up with Fran Conway, who was one of our uh, neurosurgeons here. He published six papers in neurosurgery. Six. I, I've never seen that. And so I think it's key not just to be a mentor, to be a sponsor and to have commitment and to have sort of the ability to say, you know, I believe in you. 
And I think that that's always problematic because um, if you grow up in a society where people tell you we don't believe in God, that, that's, that's tough. Um, that one uh, sixth grade teacher said, I believe in you, you're smart. The high school counselor said, I believe in you, I want to be a doctor. And my academics came back because I was at Boston, talked to a professor named Bob Haggerty, who, who sort of was a person who was a grandfather of an academic pediatric. He said, have you ever thought about academics? I said, no. Well, why don't you do this? Okay. <laughs> so at the end of the day, we need to have that inspiration, right? If you think in your own lives, who's inspired you? Okay. How have they, how have they done that? What are the things that need to go on? For all of us, right? So I think mentorship is important, but I think at the end of the day, we also need to think about how do we inspire people. And the only way you can do that is to learn about them, understand them, and then sort of push them out of the way. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I think expen Los Angeles is an expensive area, New York, Boston. I mean, it's not because we can think about, well, it's an expense, that's why they're not going to come. I think then they become, you know, are they welcome? Are they encouraged? Uh, do we talk to them about the things I spoke about? You know, saying, we want you here, we're going to do this for you. I think it is a mindset. It, as I said, it's a calculated risk because I think it is hard for us to think about who are the best, right? It's easy for us to think, okay, test scores are gonna tell us who the best are. And maybe letters from somebody that I know will tell us who's the best. But if you think about it, that's a very small kind of uh, data set. Indeed, the history that we have is when we expand that data set, we have people that lead world organizations. So I think the problem that we have is to step back and think about what are we doing what could we do different? And then take a calculated risk, try it. And, and I think we all can try to do that. Pediatrics has done this. I mean, pediatrics doesn't use the boards anymore. It just uses, if you're at this level, you do this. And then we're gonna look at, what do you bring? What other things are you gonna contribute to pediatrics? Many of these people then go into an academics. So I think part of our reflection about diversity is in that, you know, stepping back and saying, let's at least take a good look at what we're doing and how we can change it. And you know what? Risk is something that Silicon Valley is known for, right? Innovation comes with risk. Uh, innovation at Stanford came with risk. We could have failed by having all these students not succeed, but the faculty took the risk 50 years ago and it made a difference. So I can't answer what you should do. I just can answer you should think about it and reflect and talk to your colleagues. Yeah. Who? I'm sorry? Oh, Stanford? So here's the thing. I think because we have, it's so expensive to go to college. Half of all the Latino uh, students that are in college are in community colleges, 40% of African Americans. So we've spent time thinking about, well, how do we move that human capital into the four-year colleges? And I use the term human capital because that's what it is, right? At the end of the day, IQ is distributed throughout all populations. How do we pull those out that we think can be successful? How do we inspire those? You can't do that unless you're there. So we're going there to go to community colleges and say, have you thought about being a doctor? And you know what? You're smart. Those are messages that people don't get to hear if they're in community college. So I think at the end of the day, again, stepping back, 
like I got and robbed the bank. Why do you rob the banks? Well, that's where the money is, right? So I think we have to look at where is the diversity. And indeed, l let me talk about gender diversity. We saw the numbers there. Since 1983, 85, half of all the uh, people of, of for medical students are women. Uh, in pediatrics, we have only 20% chairs that are women, even though 85% of our residents are women. Of the groups that responded, we saw the Asian American, there was no Asian American chair that I could identify in pediatrics. So I think this is not just underrepresented minority, it's much broader of how we're gonna think about this. So the early in the trust program, one of the things we did was create a pyramid because we take anything from 10 to 15. And over time, they, they've told us this was the strongest thing for me to be at Stanford is I had people that cared about me, my peers. And when they did research, I did research, right? So at the end of the day, peers are important. Why people come, right, are, are you know, is that we end up in our pediatrics using our diversity of residents to talk to diversity applicants. So when somebody comes here, we know they're not gonna be isolated, they're gonna have a peer, they're gonna have a community. I, I, I know that community is, is a word everybody uses, but at the end of the day, that's what we're about, right? You can have a science community, but if you don't have anything else that fits the other concerns and needs, this may not be the place to go. So I, I think it's, yes. Well, I think two things. One, I think that discussion has to be made more broadly of why we want to do this, right? I've heard minorities often say, I don't want to be considered minority because people always consider me less, right? But the other thing that's happening, interesting, that Census Bureau says that the biggest, most rapidly growing group is the multiracial group, right? If we have a society where there's integration, we have people that come from different backgrounds. My kids, I, my grandfather fought in the Mexican Revolution, so I can say that's your heritage. My wife who grew up in Mexico, her mother was American, fought in the American Revolution. Back, you know, daughters of American. So my kids are both Mexican-American truly because they families fought in both revolutions, right? It's that kind of mixture that we start to think about is that not everybody's kind of one category. And I think that at the end of the day, we're, we're we're, we're gonna have to deal with the issue of how we talk about this, and, and that's not easy. So. So what does serving the community mean? If there is a faculty level, they serve the community by producing more doctors, by educating those that are not minority about how to take care of minority populations. So I think service uh, is, is always you know, something that one has to think about. What does it mean? <coughs> My dad, when he was a truck driver, he always kept on ask, asking me, well, when are you gonna get a real job and make some money? And I knew I made a dent because one day he came home and said, how's your research going? So, you know, I think service to the community uh, is partly understanding what does an institution like this give to the community? We give research, we educate the next generation, we provide influential cl clinical care. Is that good? Yeah, uh, is it really changing America?
Well, I think that that's what many people are trying to do. At the end of the day, you know, patient-centered care, we say we're all about that. Well, how can you be a patient-centered care? They don't look like you. They don't talk your language. So that's 3.0, thinking through that. How do we provide a program that in education or any of our fields that deals with a group of people that are different? You know, I, I, again, it's these categories by the history that we're sort of tethered to. But the future is really how do we w make the system work? How do we make America great again? Uh, how do we make America great with what it really is, which is complete diversity, complete diversity? All right, thank you.